on the Ron March, Ron March show. We were just listening to Brother Jack McDuff. He's out of the Midwest, Champaign, Urbana, uh, in Illinois, Danville, Illinois, around um, uh, Decatur, Illinois. The brother was tough in his day. Went on to the to the nightclub in the sky. <laughs> He's not with us anymore. Name is Brother Jack McDuff, and the tune is called Rock Candy. We'll play a little bit more of that uh, a little later in the show. All right. Today's date is August the 29th. It's been a very swift and powerful, informative month. The entire month has been unbelievable. I have enjoyed it. I'm glad to be a part of it. I'm glad that you guys have been a part of it. Because without you, I wouldn't be here. So I want to continue to to bring you good information, uh, raise your consciousness so you can deal with this this world that's changing as we speak. You must remember your spirit is changing. You have no control over your spirit, none. Your creator deals with all of that heavyweight stuff. So you just might as well sit back and enjoy the ride. Uh, Some of us will make it to the other side and some will not. But you can't say you didn't know because we uh, told you all about it. We told you it was coming. We uh, gave you all the information or some of the information that you need. Some of you took it, some of you didn't. So I can't do any more. I can take it to the water, but I can't make you drink. So let's Let's get down to business for today. Now, today's show, we're going to deal with mortgages. We're going to talk about securitization. 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 What is securitization? Okay? I'm dealing with a computer that I'm not that familiar with. Uh, If I want to change... uh, See how I can get out. I don't see how I can get out of it. If I push this down, escape. Nope, that ain't do it either. But we, uh, if I take this out, how do how do I get this out? You have any idea? That that, enlar- that enlarges it. Yep, it makes it bigger. Uh. Let's go with what we have on the screen. Securitization as it is being used today is illegal. It is illegal. And, uh, okay, Uh, you didn't show me how to turn it off. All right, good enough. Yep. Okay, securitization, minimize it. Then there you go, I can keep minimizing it. Securitization as we use it today is fraud. It's crooked. It's illegal. It really shouldn't work. However, several people have went to jail dealing with uh, securitization. What it amounts to is, I was trying to get a, a good definition, because what it amounts to is taking a note or a secured interest. Remember, I talked about secured interest. Taking a secured interest and monetizing it and selling it on the open market. And they'll hold it. Well, actually, they collateralize it. And then they sell it on the open market. So if I tell you I have a piece of, what is that, per Harpers paper that is expensive. I show it to you. I tell you it's worth a uh, hundred thousand uh, dollars. I sell it to you for seventy five thousand at a discount. Okay, you're going to hold on to it. Meanwhile, I got this from an individual who's making payments on this paper, and as long as they make payments, the paper can stay alive. But because it is collateral, collateralized, collateralized. Once they stop making payments, 
the paper goes down to zero. Okay? Now, when the person that bought it for 75000 realizes he's got a problem, he's going to ask for his money back. He wants to be recuperated. Recoupment. Recoupment. It's a kind of a, a business banking process that Enron, a lot of people that was dealing with Enron back in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, they went to jail because they were collateralizing uh, uh, stocks, documents, and taking in money that they didn't have, almost uh, like a advanced pyramid scheme. So anyway, what they're doing today is along the same line. They're taking your ticket item, whatever that ticket item may be, that ticket item, such as a automobile, a boat, airplane, mortgage, a house, and they are selling the note after they collateralize it. Once you close and start making payments on a hundred thousand dollars, that that note will become a hundred thousand dollars in thirty years. So it's a good investment for someone to purchase it for seventy five thousand dollars because they're in their retirement mode and they won't need it for another 25, 30 years. And then when they get uh, uh, close to retirement or get ready to retirement, they can cash it in and and have a nice, uh, uh, a, uh, what they call it, an uh, egg basket full of uh, goodies. Well, it all sounds good on paper. I was fortunate enough back in the 60s, when I came to Detroit in 1964, I got a job at Chrysler Corporation. They were driving deuce and a quarter, uh, uh, 65 deuces, 65 Bonneville, 65 Catalinas, 65 Impalas. Everybody was leaning, talking out of the side of the neck, had their portable 45 uh, uh, exchanger in their cars, and heat and leaning posts. They were ready to go. But I went into the bank and asked for a loan to buy a 65 Continental, Cat, uh, not Continental, Catalina, Pontiac. It was big also, right next to the Bonneville. Well, the banker told me, very politely, I didn't have enough collateral. Well, what he didn't know, and I told him, was I just got out of the military. I had approximately... $6,000 in Hawaii's credit union. He almost fell out of the seat when I said He said, what? I said, yes, you heard me. I got about $6,000 out there. And I was saving it, you know, for a certain thing. He said, well, i tell you what you can do. This is when I first got uh, uh, invited into this process. He said, you give me the name and and uh, the uh, address of the credit union. I will send a bond. You'll sign it, and I'll send a affidavit and a bond to a wife. They will send me, or they will hold, put a hold on. I think the, the vehicle was twenty seven hundred dollars. We'll put. They'll put a, a, a hold on the vehicle twenty twenty seven hundred. And once you pay it off. You'll be the luckiest man in the world because, number one, you'll still have your $2,700 with interest. You'll also have the automobile that you just purchased. So you really haven't lost anything. Everybody's happy. I'll make my money on the interest rates that I'll charge you up front. So he pulled out about $3,400. It just came to me. He pulled out $3,400 on a three-year uh, uh, mortgage plan or a, a, a payment plan. I forgot what my payments were. But anyway, it was all set up. When I paid that car off, I had a 19, in uh, 1968, 67, somewhere along in there, when I paid it off, I had a, a nice car, free and clear. I had my 2700 plus still in my credit union out in Hawaii. 
and uh, everything was hunky dory. He was happy because he made his money. Now, that's the way all notes are supposed to be dealt with. It's almost basic. In other words, if I borrow money from you and give you an IOU, you're going to say I need uh, uh, collateral because I don't know you that well, so you got to give me something. So I give you an uh, IOU. Well, you say, well, the IOU is good, but I still don't know you. So I say, well, what about that guy right there that you know right there in the bank? He said, yes, I know him. Good guy. I said, if I get him to sign, would you? Would, can I get the money then? He said, oh, yes. I know he's a good guy, been, in, been around here a long time. Everything is hunky-dory. So the two of us sign. I tell him I'm going to get 2700 but I'm going to pay you 3000 back. Everything's good. Now, when I pay the 3000 back, the first thing I want is my IOU. He may tell me anything. I just lost it. Um, I think I uh, gave it. I wrote a note on it and gave it to my, my daughter to take to school. She needed a note. All, all the negatives. And I say, well, I'm sorry. I cannot pay you the $3,000 I owe you because you can take me to the bank, I mean, take me to court, and the courts will make me pay you again. Oh, I wouldn't do that. Oh, no, 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 no. This was a business transaction. No friendship here. So I would have, to, I would take that money and keep it until he gave me my signature ink signature, not a copy, my ink signature IOU with his friend's name on it. Call that the ink, wet ink signature. Now, you got to understand this. It's not difficult. Because they've been cheating you ever since you've been on earth. Now, remember, at my age, the process was changing when I got mine. I probably was one of the last that got a real loan. You would call a real loan. Because he didn't put up anything. He, the bank, they never put up anything. Never. When you bought your home, when you bought your car, whatever you did, once you uh, securitized it, quote, unquote, once you took credit, it was automatically paid for. And that's the part that gets everybody confused. They cannot, for the life of them, understand that your signature creates collateral and monetizes any document you sign, even the credit card, every time you sign your credit card slip, every time you use your credit card, you have to sign a promissory note. That's why a credit card is one of the most, is the easiest debt to write off because they cannot prove that you have a debt. Because you don't know all the places you used your credit card. You could take one trip and come back and write a letter to the credit card company and ask them to validate the debt. They can't do it. They don't know where you went. They may see on the paperwork that you was in Louisville, but they don't know where that slip is. It would take them to get that $20 you spent for a sandwich or Burger King or something. It would take them damn near $100, $300 just to get that one slip back. I don't believe you understand the severity of this. After going to the meeting, our, our uh, uh, seminar last week, my mind has been spinning on all the corruptness that this system has been doing to me. And with my background, I can pick it out because I know a little bit about banking, a little bit about mortgages, enough to see that they've been ripping me off. 
And if they're ripping me off, they're showing up tearing you a new one because you don't know what the hell you're doing. You're just so happy to get the new car or the new house, you don't think about nothing. And then, out of your idiocy, you'll have to throw a party when you pay off the house. Talking about, I'm going to pay, I'm going to have a, 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 a burning Margie's party because I paid my Margie's off. And that's one of the most ignorant things I've ever heard of. You gave them three, four times as much as the house is worth through penalties and interest because they always take their interest monies off the top. When I borrowed that 2700 for the car, he didn't pull 2700 down. He pulled 3400 down. He took his $600 right off the top. And I'm not sure about the numbers, but I'm trying to give you an example. He pulled all that money right off the top. When you use your credit card, when you make your payments, you all you got to do is look at your look at it. They take that interest rate right off the top. If you pay a hundred dollars on your account, you don't get a hundred dollars assigned to your account. You get a hundred minus the interest. That's about the only honest thing they do, and that is to snatch their money off the top. You really got to know what you're looking for and what you what you really see when you're dealing with this stuff. Telling, but you know, if you don't, if you're not concerned about it then there's no need of even listening to the show. If you're not concerned about getting out of debt, because you don't really, how can you owe anyone? All credit reports are fraudulent. All credit reports are fraudulent. When they send you your 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 report, that's a, um, a mail fraud. And they send you that report in the mail. That's what you call mail fraud. You can sue them for that. No credit that you have, no matter what it is, did the quote-unquote creditor, and I'll call him quote-unquote because he's not the creditor. He is, has always been the debtor. They tell you that Sears and Roebuck is the creditor. They give Sears and Roebuck a right, the slave. Sears and Roebuck is the slave. They give the slave the right to sue the slave owner. Think about that. No slave has ever sued the slave master. Only in America. And only among ignorant people. When I say ignorant, I'm talking about those that are not in the know. And it shouldn't be. But what what can you do? If you don't know, you don't know. Let's let's move on. Let me see if I can. There you go. Let me see if I can go back to Securitization. Securitization is illegal. The process of homogenizing homogenizing financial instruments into frugal securities so that they are sellable are the security market on the security market. That's what that's what securitization is. Securitization is the process of homogenizing financial instruments. So I call it collateral, collateralizing, collateralizing, or monetizing financial instruments into frugal securities so that they are sellable on the securities market. They make your promissory note look like the real deal 
Mine was a real deal. Yours was a real deal, is a real deal, but you never get your promissory note back. So they make money twice on you. Number one, you close, you sign, you give them a contract that made you a tenant in that home that you just bought. So you became a tenant. Why did you become a tenant? Because number one, you live in the house. Number two, you just gave it back to the bank. So you're really a tenant in that home. They didn't tell you that. That's a violation of federal law, or better yet, the Currency Act, violation of the Currency Act. I'm going to give you those some of, some of those violations in a minute. They take your promissory note. Now, they already own your house because they told you they're going to keep your promissory note. When you pay for it, they're going to give it back to you. First thing they do is collateralize, monetize your promissory note, go to New York, send it to New York, and sell it on the securities market. Here's where a trick comes in. They never take your promissory note to New York. They take a security and swear that the security is once they put the once they monetize it, they swear that the security is worth let's say your house a hundred thousand a hundred thousand dollars, and they sign an oath under penalty of perjury that that's what happened. Now, if that happens, that's a that's a shady area because. If it's done correctly, they can do it. But the law says they must destroy the promissory note. Once they destroy the promissory note, the mortgage goes defunct because there's no note to go with the mortgage in order to foreclose or to give you your note back because they destroyed it when they flipped it and made a security out of it. That's not hard to understand. You should be able to pick that up. That ain't very difficult to understand. And they get away with it. Now, the only reason they got caught prior to Obama going in office, prior to the stimulus package, only reason they got caught, because the economy dropped. Once the economy dropped, payments slow down. Once payments slow down, it damages the, back, uh, what do they call it, mortgage-backed securities. This thing is, this thing is, is deep. But it, you can see it. I'm looking right at it as I explained it to you. You take 100 oranges, put them in a barrel, squash them down, and make orange juice. Okay, now you want to label that barrel mortgage-backed securities. As long as payments are made on the on the back end, the barrel remains mortgage-backed security. If one of those mortgages in that bundle go defunct, you know you got what did I say? A hundred mortgages in there. If one goes defunct, it's like a rotten apple in a barrel. All of the barrel goes defunct. So now you've got $100,000 that are, is not paid, and they will lose a million dollars on the total cost of that bundle that they sold to China. Because China, you can't, un, you can't unmake lemonade take the bad one back out and give it back to a person? You 
know, are y'all understanding me? You know, I see Andre. Let me check with Andre out there. Andre, are you there? Yes, sir. <laughs> you, am I making sense? <laughs> Plenty of sense. You can't unmake lemonade. <laughs> you cannot make unmake lemonade. So what they do? That's right. They'll start making payments on that bad note so they don't get caught. Did that for several years, and they kept paying. And then they stopped. The bank said, well, we're going to stop making payments to the bank, but we got to pay the interest because we owe it to somebody. So they started paying interest. Then they figured out that they didn't have to pay the interest, so they started paying the taxes. And, and, and you can't get around taxes because your register of deeds and your city municipal comp- uh, uh, system are not a part of these crooks. Mm-hmm. So now they're in big trouble because they, more people get laid off, more of the mortgage-backed securities look like rotten apples or rotten oranges. The more rush you keep saying, hey, wait a minute, something ain't right here. The money ain't coming in right. You done slowed down on payments. So what they what did they do? They came up with this stimulus package. They caught up, and you talk about trillions of dollars. I think the last count I heard was $7 trillion they had. Can't even visualize yep. $7 trillion. And all they did was back up those rotten uh, oranges to buy time. See if they couldn't get the economy to start working. It didn't work. The economy still not up to snuff because the only jobs they came up with was Burger King and, and uh, White Castle. So that wasn't enough for them to purchase homes, so they caught hell, and they and they catching hell. So they went. It got so bad that the United States tried to cover themselves, which was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. They sued sixteen banks that were doing this madness. Sixteen bank corporations. And when they did that, all hell broke loose because the banks scrambled so that, see, it, it's the, try to follow me on this one, Andre. It was a two-fold mm-hmm. screw. They screwed, the bank screwed Fannie Mae to the left, and the mortgage companies screwed the borrowers to the right. So we're talking about the that. same money. That's right. Now they're really in trouble. So what did they do, Andre? They said, we're going to pay you off and plead guilty and cop a plea, and you can't tell nobody what we did. Uh, and you got your bail out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, it's, oh, oh, boy. It's, un, it's, it's ungodly. It's un, and they're still doing it because the penalties, they, they done paid off the big stuff. So the penalties that they get caught with, they'd rather pay the penalties now than stop cheating the people. Now, the people that any, they say uh, 78% of all mortgages were securitized. And we know from from the lawsuit against Fannie Mae that 14, 16, 16 banks pleaded guilty. And these banks were the biggest banks in the town. So that means that, that the companies, or, the, or better yet, the, the mortgage companies are still doing the same thing, but they're willing to pay the people off because as long as the people don't know what they did and they can keep it a secret, nobody will sue them. Ignorance is bliss. Yes, sir. Now, there's one lady who was fighting for where's my note. She went through 5,000 documents that she scrapped. I don't know how she got them. She got a hold of them from the lawsuit and put it all together. She figured out what the crimes were that they pleaded guilty to. And it ranged from, oh, man. It was, it was a, a variety of charges that RICO 
should be used by everybody when they sue for their help, for their compensation for their homes. But it's, it's such a tedious process. If you don't know how to do it and what to do, you're going to have to pay some money because I'm preparing myself. I, I got I lost two uh, rental properties on the same process, and I'm getting ready to sue, hopefully, and hit the right vein and get all my money back. Because they, when the when the lady threw her mm-hmm. suit in, and I'm talking about. They gave her $95 and made her sign a gag order. $95 million. What am I talking about $95? $95 million and told her to keep her mouth shut or she will go to jail. But now, since the government stepped in, I think the government even took her her, her case and realized she, she brought up stuff the government didn't even know. So the government hit the, hit the gold mine when they told the government, stop, don't don't dig no further. We will pay. We plead guilty. We'll pay off. And by doing that, and since they had her case involved, now she can go back and get $385 million that's laying on the table with her name on it. Wow. It's hard. It's, it, it's, it's madness. When I, I just got up this morning preparing for the show, and I saw it. I read read my article. And I said, "Oh my goodness! I, I just I just fell backwards." I said, "What the hell?" Oh, it was deep, unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yep. When you sign a mortgage note, it comes under UCC Article Three. After securitization, it comes under Article Eight. That's when the cheating starts. See, securitization really is not illegal. But what they do with securitization, it fades from 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 color of no, from legal color of law to totally illegal. And they think that scheme is so powerful that they're willing to take a chance to keep doing it and the government knows it and 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 the well the people don't know it, so they say to the hell with it. By the time the people figure it out, we may be out of business or the country may come to you. Whatever. They, I don't know. We'll worry about mm-hmm. it when they, when they come. It's unbelievable. Under U.S. law, securitization is illegal because it is fraudulent. If it starts out securitizing, it's supposed to stay securitizing, and that, and that promissory note is supposed to stay in check. All the way through. But you cannot monetize it because the federal government's got a law that if you monetize it or collateralize it, you must destroy the promissory note. It's automatically destroyed. So once you do an audit, I want everybody out there to hear me. I can do audits. I know how to get audits done. Let me put it that way. I don't do it personally, but I know how to get them done. So if you got a mortgage and you're having trouble or you've been put out of your house, you need to get an audit. And the audit will tell you if the promissory note was securitized. And if it was securitized, it does not exist. So if you can prove the date of securitization and the date of eviction are two different dates, you got them by the old kazoo. Follow me, <laughs> That's a mm-hmm. deep stuff, ain't it? Yes, it is. I'm telling you. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. And I don't mean uh, a, a $60,000 house. You're going to get $60,000. You got penalties. You made payments. You had uh, uh, possessions in the home. When they came and threw your butt out, you don't know you had that. You, you had my uh, $6,000 shotgun I lent you. You ain't paid me back for that. <laughs> you didn't know that is. My wife lent you that fur coat, and she let you use her diamonds. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Unbelievable. Wow. Wow. Man, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Okay. Instruments such as loans, credit cards, and receivables are securitized. 
Enron was involved in securitization, and someone brought charges against them. But almost all large corporations are doing it as usual, business as usual. However, the banking system and the government are also doing it. See, the go- like I said, mm-hmm. the government didn't know what they were doing until that lady got involved in it. And they, when they when they saw what she was doing, the government said, "Whoa, wait a minute! Mm-hmm. They, they ripped us off. They, we want that uh, seven trillion dollars back." And and the <laughs> I mean, think about it. Think about the arrogance of a corporation. You just got caught cheating people. And you got the, the nerve to say, yeah, okay, we'll pay the fine and here, blah, 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 and we're going to keep on doing it. They probably made the money back already. No, they do. They, don't want to give up. they do not want to give up that income, that money income. And people are no, none the wiser because if the economy starts booming again, don't nobody care. They, are. they don't care. They'll, they'll keep making payments because they got the money to make the payments. And they definitely don't want to fight, because you know, fight ain't in everybody to fight. Yeah, everybody can't do it. Yep. This one lady, uh, Jean Keating, you might have heard her name before, brought a RICO suit against the bank, but it was thrown out. Now, what does that tell you? Yeah, John talk about Jean Keating a lot. Yep. But he would have done better now that he knows more about it. See, people are learning as we go along. And that's what I was telling uh, my uh, uh, paralegal. We don't want to leap out there too soon because there's so much information coming in. We need to make sure we got our ducks in, 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 a, in a row. In a row, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And all it is is all accounting, whether it is the bank, Civil or criminal court, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. And once you realize that the that the court system, which is the judge and prosecutor and are the attorneys, they don't use the prosecutor a lot because it's civil case. They're all crooked. They are all in favor of the mortgage company, and the mortgage companies pay them well to put their careers on the line to represent them. Because once it comes down the pipe. They're going to throw everything on them lawyers. That's how dumb they are. And Trot and Trot was one of the biggest crooks in Michigan because not only did they have representation for the, for the mortgage company, they had a servicing company known as Process. I, I, I got it in one of the orders. Loan Processing Service. Those were the ones that were supposed to start collecting monies from the people. That's a conflict of interest. And they only told the people what they wanted them to know because if the people filed complaints, they used the robocops. That's what robocops, robo signers. That's where they come from. These types of uh-huh. servers that know they're crooked, so they have uh, robo signers standing by. So when they ask for these certain things and they want ink signatures, they use a clause in. Uh, Article 3, known as lost or damaged note. And they tell you what you have to do in order to produce one. And you got it under oath, and then you got a lot of small stuff. But this is just... Madness. Yes. Yes. And if you try to tell somebody, they look at you like you're crazy. And then if you keep talking to them, they say, well, what you going to do about it? I don't know about it. You're telling me about it. Can you get mine back? Well, yeah, I can get it back, but it's going to cost you money. I can't do this on my own by myself. Time, you got to dig out all the paperwork, a whole lot of stuff. But I'm working on a process that I'm going to streamline it so well that anybody ought to be able to file it just like you do a a credit card. File this file it in federal court because it's got to go through federal court because the mortgages belong and the corporation belong to the federal government. Isn't that something? Mm-hmm. It is all accounting, whether it's banking, civil or criminal. 
FAS 125, securitizing account, FAS 140, offsetting of financial assets and liabilities, FAS 133, derivatives on hedge accounts, C, FAS uh, 5, FAS 95, See, I'm going to look up this FAS. I don't know what that stands for yet. But they, they set up the GAAP. They, they set up GAAP, generally accepted accounting principles. All banks are supposed to use GAAP and GAAS. Is that what the GAAP insurance, when they, when they say GAAP insurance, is that what they're talking about? Yes. General accepted accounting principles. They're supposed to check when they do an audit. They're supposed to go in with this GAS, GAAP principle and use it to check the books to make sure everything is coping steady. Right. The banks are mandated by Title 12 USC to follow GAAP and GAAS. They have a local ASB and an international IFASB. They also cover derivatives. FAS 140 relates to UCC, I sent you this last night, UCC 3 305 and 306. Did you get, yep, did you I get that? It. Yeah. I got it. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Very interesting read. Yeah. See, Jonah proved a point to me, and that is the system is our system. It was set up by us to protect us. I know this is hard to believe, but everything I'm telling you is on the books. Jonah showed us that when he brought out the Currency Act. Everything we need to get free financially is in the Currency Act. But the name of the game, they don't teach us how to read legalese, and they hold back on information. I would bet you most people don't even know what a currency act is. And and mm -hmm. and surely when I say 1864, because that was the last time we put a, a currency together to protect us, because the Europeans took over in 1865 after the quote-unquote Civil War. So you know they weren't going to create nothing that was going to hinder them. So what right. they had to do was hide, trick, and and miseducate everybody on what was on the books because they wasn't allowed to change the books. That's why they were known as statues at large. And that wonderful word that I, I, I forget to use so often, have you ever heard of stare decisis? No. When I heard that, when I heard that the first time, I looked at Bobby L. I said, "Bobby, what did you say?" He said, "Stare decisive." I said, "Are you pronouncing it right? Are you are you kidding me? I ain't never heard that shit before in my life." He said, "Look it up." I looked that baby up, uh, Andre. You know what it said? What? It's a it's a it's a protection on statues at large that they can never, ever, ever change or challenge because they're stare decisive, which means that they've already been tried, tried, and tried again, and they can't break it. So they just put it up wow. and call it stare decisive. Wow. <laughs> ain't, that about you close, ain't that something? Are you close to a dictionary? Uh, or, or, actually, or, or, I, actually, I am. Give me, a, give me a minute here. I'm going to pull up my Black's Law Dictionary. All right. I want you to take a peek at that. Stare just, I told Bobby L. I said, man, good God of my, he said, yes. He said, everything we need is already on the books. He was talking Jonah Bay before I knew Jonah Bay. Before they were the Jonah Bay. Yep. I didn't realize that that brother was 
was was was so up on it because you know how Bobby was. Bobby stayed with the history of the Moors more than he did commercial and stuff like that. But when you get it up, I want you to look up Stare Decisive. S T A R E Stare. Stare Decisive. Yes. Yes. D E C. All right, stare is two words, S-T-A-R-E. Mm-hmm. The second word is decisive, D-C-C-I-S-I-S. All right. What is it? Looking it up now. Looking it up now. Okay. All right. Stare decisive. See, this is why the wow, the book. Yes. This is a big, gigantic book open right to it. I got it right here. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what did it say? Stare decisive. Man, this is a long ass definition. Here we go. All right. To abide by or adhere to decided cases. Policy, of course, to stand by precedent and not to disturb settled point, which is what you just said. It's been yep. tried and tried again. Yeah. And they got a, a couple of cases here in there. Neff versus George, 364, illustration 306, 4, NE, 2D, 388, 390, and 391. Doctrine that when court has once laid down a principle of law as applicable to a certain state of facts, it will adhere to that principle and apply it to all future cases where facts yeah. are sustainably the same, regardless of whether yeah. the parties and property are the same. Horn versus Moody. Texas yep. Civil appellate, appellate, probably. I think that's what ATT is. 146-SW-2D-505-509-510. Under doctrine, a deliberate or solemn decision of court made after argument on question of law fairly arising in the case <laughs> and necessary to its determination is an authority or binding precedent in the same court in other courts of equal or lower rank in subsequent cases where the very point is again in controversy. Yes. And uh, it's, got, it's got a few more court cases in here, and that's good, the that's explanation good basically is the same. It all it all basically says the same thing. If the decision yes. has been made, no matter what. Yes. And you can't change it. And if you can right. find that one that's close, you can use it on any case. Any, any court that you're in, you can use it. Mm-hmm. And judges hate it because it, and you know lawyers hate it, but judges hate it because it has because to stand. Because it has to stand, yes. yeah. Yes. Yes. And if it don't stand, you got grounds for appeal. Mm-hmm. You know judges do not like to lose an appeal. That's some heavy stuff, ain't it? That's heavy as hell, yeah. They're decisive. I, I ain't never heard of it. <laughs> I it's still my first don't know time hearing of it. Yeah. They're decisive. All right. The note is not under a, a negotiable instrument anymore. When they're talking about, you back up. These are resource materials for understanding this process. The note is not under a negotiable instrument anymore. It is a security. Once they collateralize it, it becomes a security. And once it becomes a security, it's no longer a note. And they can't foreclose on you because they don't have a note or to match with the mortgage. Because the note, let me see how they say that. The, The mortgage is like the tail of a dog. It follows the note. The mortgage is the... it is the instructions on what to do to pay the note. Mm -hmm. So the note's the dog and the mortgage is the tail. So when they destroy the the note, the mortgage is automatically destroyed. Wow. So how are you going to foreclose? And this is on every every mortgage. This ain't on one or two or, or, you know, pick a company, a, a bank, and this bank, not that bank. No, it's on every one of them. Every one that they securitize, they break into the law because they don't do it right. Secure, I, when they did mine, 
from Hawaii, that was a proper securitization. I got my money back. I got the interest on the note. I got the note back, which was the bond. And I got interest on the bond. They got interest on my payments. They took the payments out of the first payment or two because they didn't borrow twenty seven hundred on my on my mm-hmm. on my money. They borrowed thirty. Because you had the collateral, yeah. Because you had the collateral in the Hawaii Bank for that, so to cover yes. that. Yes. It's kind of like yes. a kind of like a secure, kind of like my secure credit card. I yes. had so much money put up, and uh, I borrow yes. against that whenever the whenever the account, whenever I decide to close the account, I get my original investment back or my original yes. money that's in my account back. So I kind of yes. I kind of get what what you're saying there. Yeah. yeah. Yep. But so they've been small people over all these years. Boy, these oh years. boy. Yes. Yes. People have gone imagine. to their grave. Yes. Yes. Man. Note <laughs> the note is not under a negotiable instrument anymore. It is a security. All the banks follow mm-hmm. these standards. All of them are crooks. They set up yeah. gap, generally expected, uh, uh, accepted, generally accepted accounting principles. These are mandated by Title 12 USC. So follow gap and GAAS. They have a local. Uh, FASB and an international IFASB also cover derivatives. Now, you know how them derivatives are. I don't even want to go into that. If you want mm-hmm. to instruct them on how to do offsets, you have to refer uh, where am I? Refer them to FAS 133. We back up. FAS 140 relates to UCC 3-304, three, I mean 305, 306. If you want to instruct them on how to do offsets, you have to refer them to FAS 133. If they don't know the accounting regulations, can't give them the proper instruction for settling and closing. What you really want is recoup, recoupment. So if they can't do what you say you want them to do, and I'm and I'm just looking at that and saying, give me my promissory note back. You are entitled to recoupment. Recoupment. Mm-hmm. And here's what okay. recoupment is. Let me get let me move it up. Recoupment. Yeah, not too far. Ah! I'm using a new computer and. Uh, a different computer is not new. I'm having a, a little bit of problem. Okay. Um, here's what recruitment, a recoupment is. A recovery or regaining of expenses applied to set off. So you can get back what you gave and what you are entitled to. Ain't that what I said? When I paid mine off, I got back what I gave them. And everything that I was entitled to. I had the car, paid in full, and I had interest on my money. The withholding for the equity part are all of something that is due. This is all equitable action in admiralty style instruments. Like Law's Dictionary talks about, and I, this is what I just said IOU, a memorandum acknowledging a debt. See also due bill. A due bill, see IOU. A site draft. This is this is interesting. A draft that is due on the bearer's demand, as me, demanding, or on proper presentment to the drawer. And see, last night when I sent you that info, I did not give you a definition of, of the drawer or the drawee. I'm gonna have to go back and add that in there. And I did, I did pretty, and I do pretty good on the. Uh, uh, yeah, definition. Ab- absolutely, absolutely. Yep. Yep. And that, that obligor and obligee, I gotta do that. So I got four. I'm gonna put in there, obligor and obligee. That's some deep stuff. And a yes, draft is. is an uncon- 
a draft is an unconditional order signed by one person. You see, that's the promissory note that you give them. It's only signed by you. The drawer di- directing under, I mean, the drawer directing another person, the draw E to pay a certain sum of money on demand or at a definite time to a person. The payee or... It says here... It says here, the person who draws a bill or draft is the drawer, definition of drawer. The person who draws a bill or draft, the drawer of a check is a person who signs it. The person who creates or executes a draft, that is, issues it, as, and in signing the instrument gives the order to pay contained uh, therein. <clears throat> the drawer engages upon dishonor of the, tra- the draft and any necessary notice of dishonor or protest. He will pay the amount of he will pay the amount of the draft to the holder or to any endorser who takes it up. The drawer may disclaim this liability without, or excuse me, the drawer may disclaim this liability by drawing without recourse. UCC symbol 3-413 parenthesis 2. Now the drawee is the person whom, on whom the bill or draft is drawn. A person to whom a bill of exchange or draft is directed and who is requested to pay the amount of money therein mentioned. The drawee of a check is the bank on which it is drawn. The drawee of a check is the bank on which which it is drawn. When drawee accepts, he engages that he will pay the instrument according to its tenor at the time of his engagement or as completed. UCC. 3-413, 3-413, parenthesis 1. So that's, really that's, the, uh, that's the definition of the drawer and the drawee. Yeah. See, we need, and I know they don't teach legalese. I've never seen it. Yeah, they probably do, but you, it probably is mixed in with another course. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, we need to get somebody that can read that stuff. Maybe Betty can do it a little better. You know what I'm saying? Or understand mm-hmm. We all can read it. We all can read it, but we don't understand it. You know? Mm-hmm. Now they're talking about this is colorable. Who is holding the debt? The do bill is like a site drill, a draft. They are not saying from which perspective it is a debt, from their, from theirs to yours. See, when you give them your promissory note, you are the creditor. They are the debt. Because they owe you that note back. You gave them the note that paid for the house. When you pay for the house, you get the note. You're supposed to get the note back. I think that's what it, mm-hmm. the way it goes. And that's what they call a site draft because you, what you gave them was a one signatured contract or one signature check. And see, that's what a check is anyway. Come to think about it, it's a site draft. Anybody's check or a money order because nobody else signed it. Now, once they sign it and cash it, that's when they become the debtor. Because the money is not their money. That's where I get confused. Because they didn't do anything. What did they do? What did the banks do? They didn't give uh, Sears and Roebuck the money for the Cadillac or for the car. The bank cashed it. They used your mm-hmm. credit. They pulled off your account. To pay for that, mm-hmm. that um, the creditor. Uh, yep. Non- yep. Yep. Where, where, and why did we have to use a bank? What did they do? What did a bank do? Nothing. Now, if they got a credit card, yes, they, they give you a, a, a sixteen cent plastic piece of thing called a credit card, and then they will keep mm-hmm. track of your of your spending. So they do the accounting. So let's say that's about $10 a month, for example. What else did they do? How do they get involved when you go out and spend $20,000 for a motorboat? What do the banks do? Do they give you 
the 20,000? No, they did not. Did you see the 20,000 coming from the bank? No, they did not. Where did it come from? It came from your private account. Because when you filled out your application, you gave them your EIN number, and they had, had access to your Cisco account. And once they get the money out of there, it's automatically paid for. Now you're making payments to the bank. Bank ain't had no boat. And see, here's the bottom mm -hmm. line. There's nothing wrong with that. Only they didn't tell you they was getting ready to screw you. They didn't give right. you full disclosure. They make you think that the bank gave you $20,000. That's why you must. Every time you get a bill, you must ask the bank to uh, uh, verify the debt. We need you to verify. We need in writing that you screwed me. Yep. Now, when he comes, when he comes back with a letter talking about you, the pay, pay history and the agreement, see, that's what they send you back, pay history and agreement. That has nothing to do with the $20,000. Answer, you need to do a, and you, we talked about it last night, Andre. You need to do an mm -hmm. administrative administrative procedure. Administrative oh, process, yep. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Man, man. You see you see how powerful this information is? And all of that comes out of Saturday. Jonah was talking about that on Saturday. But you got to be yep. creative to think. And as I talk to you, you're you're beginning to think and see how they're screwing you. Mm -hmm. A due bill is like a site draft. They are not saying from which perspective it is a debt from theirs to yours. The party receiving the IOU is the debtor. Whoever you gave your promissory note to was the debtor. Because the IOU is an asset. It's worth something. They give you nothing. It is an instrument. You are the originator. You have monetized their system with your signature. Ain't that what, I, ain't that what I've been saying? Yep. <laughs> Same thing on the, on the live birth record. When mama signs that paperwork, she monetizes, monetizes it. Mm -hmm. And once she gives up the uh, uh, power of attorney, they can put any amount they want on it. She don't know the money's in, the, in her account. So what difference does it make? Whew. Ain't that something? Well, boy. It's crazy. And you huh? are in an asset, and you is an asset instrument, but, I mean, asset instrument, not a liability instrument. This is one of the places where you have your perspectives changed. When you got that promissory note and you sign it, you are the kingpin. You're the top of the line. And when mm -hmm. you give it to them, you're still the top of the line because they haven't done anything, nothing. And it's already monetized because you signed it. Under the Constitution, the government was not given authority to create money. It is a power reserved by the people. Article 1, Section 10 restrict, restricts the states from making gold coins. So the corporate government has to rely on deceptive deception of people to create money. Ain't that something? Mm -hmm. So the way money is created is with people sign an IOU or promissory note. Promissory. It is not a debt instrument to the one who created it. It is it is actually an asset. Woo! It, oh, man. Oh man, oh man, oh man. Man, oh man. Well, I'm telling you, 
telling you, man, this is a very eye awakening. You know what I mean? Yes. Very eye awakening. They've been getting away with it for so many years. That's the that's the crazy thing about it. Yep. And <laughs> that's what John means when he says we're we're illiterate because we don't we don't. It's not that we can't read words. We can't comprehend what the what this legalese and all this stuff is. Yes. Yes. So, so now I got a hundred. Let me see. Let me see. Uh, if we have any callers? On the wrong, I got the, I got the wrong job. Let's see if we have any colors. Uh, we got, we don't have any questions. And this is a, it's kind of my, it, Ron, are you going? Are you going in and, and out? And it's good. So let me get over here closer. Is that better? Yes. Better, Still yeah. me? No, it sounds All right. better now. All right. Good enough. All right. We got questions for the bank. I'm going to get off of that for a minute. You, uh, It's a request to admit, and you're writing this to the bank, or you're asking the bank. You're, you are requested to admit for the purposes of this proceeding only the truth of the following facts. I won't read them all. I'll just tap at them. What was the purpose of the borrower coming to the bank? The answer would be for a loan. That's why I came here, for a loan. Were the funds to be paid to the alleged borrower or seller of the house? The check was written to the seller. I didn't know that. Well, I didn't because I don't go to the bank. The, the real estate people goes to the bank to get those checks. The check written, does it uh, represent the asset of the bank? It did not. I do not, better yet, I do not know. The check written, does it represent an asset of the bank? Are you following me on this, Andre? Yes. Okay. Um, is it? A bank policy to first deposit money into an account before writing a check on that account? And the bank would say, I guess so. Mm -hmm. Where did the funds yeah. originate to fund the check? Answer, what do you mean originate? Did the bank originate the funds for the check or did the borrower originate the funds for the check? Again, I don't know. The bank came, the money came from a pool of money at the bank. Now, we know ain't no money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Number seven, according to your understanding of the agreement, do you believe the bank or borrower was the original, original, originate the funds to issue the bank loan check or did issue the bank loan check? I think the bank was the one who originated the loan. To the best of your knowledge, where did the funds originate from? From a liability. Really getting complicated. So you say a liability. Yeah. Banks have assets and liabilities. Can you explain to the court the difference between an asset and a liability with respect to a mortgage? Answer. An asset is something you own and can sell. A liability is what you owe. Is it your position, your own uh, a mortgage, is it your position you own the mortgage note? Yes, the bank owns, the, owns it. Did you issue a check based on the value of the mortgage note? Yes. Then the asset you use to issue the check was that a mortgage note? Was that of a mortgage note? Yes. Is it your belief that the bank has a standard operating policy? I think so. Are banks bookkeeping entries in conflict with in conflict with banking laws? No. Are banks bookkeeping entries in compliance with banking laws? 
Yes. Are you aware that in this country, banks can lend money? Yes. Wow. Trapping. Does the law provide what kind of money the banks can loan? I don't know. I am not an attorney. Is there any particular definition of money under that act? I don't know. Is it your position that your your bank loans the kind of money reported by the act? Yes. Is it presumed that the bank will not act unlawfully given the nature of the law's governing activity? They didn't answer. Do you know what money looks like? Yes. Can you describe what money looks like that was to be loaned to the borrower? Yes. Please describe that what money looks like. The witness, the bank, describes greenbacks. Is that all the money... In the United States, you are aware of the banks using? Yes. What is credit? The same as money. Wow. Wow. <laughs> How much was wow, the Wow, really? Yeah. Is that something? How much was the <laughs> loan? $100,000. Is that $100,000 in cash or cash equivalent? Is that $100,000 in cash or cash equivalent? Yes. What did the bank have to loan the borrower in order for the bank to legally own the promissory note? They're really trapping them now. Want to know? <laughs> yeah. Is the bank, if the bank refuses to loan $100,000, is it your position that the bank still owes the, owns the promissory note? If the bank refused to loan the $100,000, the bank would not legally own the promissory note. Was the borrower was the borrower to loan the bank anything? No. Was the borrower to deposit anything? No. Man. You know, it, 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 it sounds crazy. What we're really talking about is what the people in the bank really know about. And the answer is nothing. Mm -hmm. yep. You did? They just there to get a check, do a job, and get a check. Do a job. Whew. Was the borrower to loan the bank anything? No. Was the was the borrower to deposit anything? No. Was the borrower to exchange the promissory note with credit in in the borrower's transaction account? I never heard of that. Before. And it's a hundred and sixty-five questions, which I won't go through all of them, but you get a gist of how ignorant the banks are really are. And yeah. it's not the banks that are ignorant. It's the people the, the bank hire. They, they don't want a genius down on that on the counter. That's by design. Always, yeah, that's by design. Yep. By design. They always hire idiots. Questions for the bank auditor or head accountant. Are the bank bookkeeping entries to correlate to the bank loan agreement? Yes. According to your understanding, who owns this promissory note? The bank. Was someone to loan something to someone according to this paper? Yes. Tell me who you think was the loan actually exactly received. Tell me who you think was to loan exactly what to whom according to this. The bank was to loan $100,000 to Mr. Victim. <laughs> In your opinion, do the banks do the banks today, when making loans based on mortgages, part with a, a asset when they grant loans when the banks pay the seller of the house or the alleged borrower? Yes. On uh, 228.87, the moment before, a second before the mortgage note was signed, did the bank have the funds to loan the borrower? Yes. Where did the assets come from? From a pool of bank money. That's where they always get them. What pool of bank money? Did the bank assets decrease by the amount of the loan? I don't know because I do not review the bank booking entry. On the standard bank loan, if the loan if the bank loan an asset, would the bank asset decrease by the amount of the loan? No. Not at that at that time. 
Oh, uh, not at that time. Where am I at? Uh, when uh, when will it not decrease? When the bank replaces the borrower's promissory note with the deposit depositor's cash. Oh, is the bank actually non cash or opposed to the check? Normally, it is a check. Do banks' liabilities increase if these checks is deposited at a bank? You know, you see where they're going. You see where they're going with this. I won't read any more. They're just questioning people that work in the bank, and it looks like they had them on the stand, and they were supposed to, you know, like cross-examine these, these individuals. And uh, in so doing, they come up with all these silly, unfounded answers. So that lets gives you a little idea of what you're working with when you're dealing with these mortgages. Unbelievable. Let's take a, a a quick. Can I take a quick a quick break? And uh, I'll be right back. Let me see where I get this music. Oh, there you go. Take a front room is proud to present America's most exciting jazz. All right. Be right back, Andre. Back. That brother Jack McDuff tough. That's all I can say. That brother's tough. <laughs> How you like that, Andre? Oh, yeah, it's jamming, man. <laughs> I got to have your old music back up in there now, too, so. Okay, you gonna put yeah, some more back to, in? I'm about to get your uh, station identification drop in there very soon too. All right, that'll work. That'll work. Okay. All right. All right. We are about uh, got a half hour left. I'm wondering if there's any callers that you may have uh, questions on your mortgages. Uh, I'm coming from the nitty gritty, and you need to to know what I know prior to them setting up a foreclosure. Everybody makes money. I think it's a $4,700 payoff on every eviction for time and trouble, $4,700 the mortgage companies pay. So if you're in a foreclosure, uh, it ain't too, excuse me, it's not too late to win, but it's too late to stop them from doing what they're doing. I have not found a silver bullet that will make them back up and uh, leave you alone. I'm searching for it. Uh, once I get it, I, you know I'm definitely going to use it and let everybody know about it, but I don't have it. But I will tell you that the mortgage companies realize that they are crooks and they have been caught. Federal government... Uh, ordered 16 of the nation's largest mortgage lenders and, and services to reimburse homeowners who were improperly foreclosed on. There is a national uh, mortgage, home mortgage lawsuit that's out there. And they tell me that if you get a hold to it, go to Exhibit G. And Exhibit G will give you most of the violations that they were they were caught with their hands in the cookie jar. I do have a copy of the mortgage that I could send you. If you email me, I could send you a copy of it. But all in all, there is uh, they were found guilty. No, they weren't. They were not found guilty. They pleaded no contest and settled out of court. Government regulators also directed the financial firms to hire auditors to determine how many homeowners would have avoided foreclosures in 20, 2009 and 2010. Citibank, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Chase, and Wells Fargo. Those are five big biggers. Uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, that's one. So there's four, four big ones. 
were among the financial firms cited in the joint report by the Federal Reserve, Officers of Thrift Supervision, and Office of the Comptroller of Currency. That's the gentleman who determines who violated the Currency Act. And every one of those banks violated the Currency Act. The Fed said it believed financial penalties were appropriate and that it planned to levy fines in the future. All three regulators said they would review the foreclosure audits. That's what I'm telling you. You need to get an audit if you are interested in a relatively long lawsuit to get your to be compensated for getting put out of your home, no matter what the circumstances. Because the federal government had programs set up to catch up with your mortgage payments and your your behind mortgage loans. And the banks saw fit not to use them. Because again, they could make more money by putting you out because they could get new promissory notes. It's a, It was a racket. It was a RICO racket. And don't don't forget the judges who approved to put you out when they did not have the proper paperwork and they knew they didn't have the proper paperwork, but since you didn't bring it up, they didn't care. And most of the attorneys that you hired were afraid to bring it up. So it was a three-ring circus. For, in the four years since the housing bust, about 5 million homes have been foreclosed on. About 2.5 wow. primary primary mortgages were in foreclosure at the end of last year. Another 2 million were 90 days or more past due, putting them in risk of foreclosure. Critics, including Democratic lawmakers in Congress, say the order is too lenient on the lenders. And I say the same thing. House Democrats introduced legislation Wednesday that would require lenders to perform a series of steps, including an appeal and appeals process before starting before starting uh, foreclosures. I want to know what abuses the government agencies identified, which banks committed them, and how how their proposed consent agreements is going to fix these problems. That's what Elijah C- uh, Cummings of Maryland, black uh, Democrat from Maryland, that's what he said. He's a ranking member of the House Government and Oversight Committee. Based on what I have read, I am not encouraged at all. The other lenders and service providers cited by agencies included Alley Finance, Finance, Aurora Bank, Everbank, HSBC, MetLife Bank, One West Bank, a PNC, Sovereign Bank, SunTrust Bank, U.S. Bank, Lending Processing Services, and MERS. Now, Lending Processing Services is owned by David Trot, that bastard uh, from here. From Detroit. Detroit trot and trot. He owns trot and trot. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's where you yeah. heard it from. Yeah. He owns the lending processing service. He's the one that started introducing uh, the robo, robo signer. Citibank, in a statement that it had self identified, needed changes in 2009 and that it helped. It has helped more than 1.1 million homeowners avoid foreclosure. We are committed to working with our regulators to further strengthen our program in these areas and meeting these requirements, the company said. Allied Finance, formerly known as GMAC, GMAC, said it had found, had not found any instant incident where a homeowner was foreclosed upon without being in significant default. Isn't that a a, a catch-all statement? Without specifically identifying uh, incidents of bad foreclosure, the government agency noted 
in its report that the deficiencies in foreclosure processing observed among these major services may have widespread consequences for the housing market and borrowers. John Taylor, Chief Executive in National Community Reinvestment Coalition, a consumer housing watchdog, said the government's action is a year too late. It does little to help those who are just now wrestling with a foreclosure and those who have already been displaced, he said. Rather than moving swiftly to seize people's homes, the bank should have done a better job helping people lower their mortgage payments through modification programs. This should have happened a long time ago, he said. There are so many people who, if they have received a meaningful modification, could have stayed in their homes. Isn't that something? Wow. Wow. Yep. I'm telling you, man, it's, uh, when I read it, I just, and it was several articles, I just went bonkers just printing them out. Mortgage fraud process. If you have a, a, a original closing mortgage documents available, you'll, mm -hmm. be, you'll be able to flip through them and see what the mortgage companies have done to defraud you. The two main documents that I will be referring re referring to will be the note and the deed of trust or the mortgage. The note is commonly referred to as promissory note. However, it is not a traditional promissory note. First thing that I'll tell you is that at the end of this mortgage fraud settlement process, which takes two or four months to complete, faster if you need be, Based upon your individual circumstances, you will have free and clear title to your home. The reason I they don't that, want that. No, no. The reason I say that with confidence is because you are the rightful owner of your home. Look at the deed of trust. Your name is on it. You've already paid for your house. It was paid for in full before you even signed the papers at escrow. You didn't even know it, nor was it disclosed to you. See, that's the part that you can get them. They never disclosed to you what they've done, good, bad, or indifferent. Nine times out of ten, it's indifferent, and they never disclosed that to you. The promissory note starts out referring to you as a borrower. It talks about the borrower's promissory promise to pay. Following these words, it says, in return for a loan that I have received. After that, it says, I promise to pay. And then the actual dollar figure is listed. I've looked at mine a hundred times. That is exactly what it says. Then the promissory note mentions the installment payments and interest. Then the note says, in return for a loan that I have received. Then a date is listed on that note. The question is, when you went to the title company or escrow company and signed all the documents for your mortgage, had you already received a loan? That's an important The note that you signed yeah. says at the very top, in return for a loan that I have received. What this is telling you is that you have received the loan sometime before the date you are signing that note. And guess what? Your real promissory note is your application that you sign months before you foreclose. I mean, not, not wow. before, before you close. I think, think back. You always put in an application and a little down payment. Am I right? As soon as you see a house that you want, you let the people know, your, your real estate know that you want that house, and they say, well, we got to fill out an application, and you need to put a little bit down so nobody else can get to the house. That mm -hmm. application creates the money that you're going to use to pay off. That's why they say in the promissory note that you've already received the loan. 
You got something? Now, all of that is fraud because they never informed you of that. Yep. You see what you see where I'm coming from? The whole thing is fraud. <laughs> yes. The question is, when you went to the title company, an escrow company, you had already received the loan. That is important. That is an important question. The note that you signed says at the top, in return for a loan that I have received. What this is telling you is you received the loan sometime before the date that you signed the note. Let's say that. And they pulled it out of your creditor. They put, according to Germany, said that the, the, the all caps name is uh, at the bottom and that the creditor name is at the top of the loan. That's true. But that that one is, is on your mortgage. I'm thinking on your, uh, I got to go back and look, but I know you signed your upper and lower cap name at the bottom of your application. Yeah. Now the question is. Unfortunately, I haven't done it. Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't done a mortgage yet, but uh, this is good knowledge mm -hmm. to have going in. Yes, yes, but you're going to get screwed and tattooed if you don't know what you're looking for. Okay. The note That's that sure. you signed yeah. said, oh, yeah. Let's say that the, that you signed the note on February the 12th. What what the words I re, in return for a loan I have received really means that in some time before the 12th, of, you received the loan. In fact, the fact is you did not actually receive a loan before that date. Matter of fact, you never received any kind of a loan at all, at any time. There was no loan received or provided or provided you. These whole loaning you money to buy a house is a complete, total fraud. Now that couple of paragraphs in itself is your first violation that you can use when you start suing these people because they lied to you right from the beginning. And nobody told you that you were signing these papers and you had already received a loan, which you never saw. There never was a loan. The fact is, you did not receive a loan before the date that you signed the note. You didn't see a cash in check in the mail a few days before you went and signed these papers, did you? You didn't get any kind of electronic transfer into your checking account before you, you signed either. When we go to the title company and sign the mortgage document, we see the words at the top, in return for a loan that I have received. We might think, I'll sign this, and after I sign it, I guess I have received a, a loan. But that is not what the documents say. If there is ever a legal controversy concerning whether you actually received a loan prior to signing, or assume you received a loan at the time of signing, which side will you win? The side that argues their assumption or the side that argues the exact words. On the paper, you sign. You know the answer to that. It's the words on the document that will win. You have said, I received a loan, and you did not. <laughs> when you see a document that states, in return for a loan that I have received, and we know for a fact that no loan was received, something odd is going on. When it says, have see received in the past tense, as though a past event has already occurred by the date you are signing the note. We know that it was a meaning for that. It was by design, as you say. Everything mm -hmm. in legal terms and legalese means something. The meaning of the word have received is the same event already happened. If you know that it didn't happen, something is wrong. Somebody is not telling the truth. Who is not telling the truth? As you take a close look at the note, something very interesting is taking place. Did you know that you created that note? Did you know that you created the deed of trust? If you closely examine the wording on the note, 
and the deed of trust, it will begin to make sense to you. It says, I will do this, I will do that, in return for a loan that I have received. I promise to pay. I understand this. I will do this, etc. Proceeds through the note. You realize that these are statements that have printed that uh, have printed out for you, that they have printed out for you, but you are the one who is signing the document. So it looks like you have produced and, and provided these documents, these statements to them. In signing these documents, you assert that in return for a loan that I received, it looks like they are tricking you into signing a statement that isn't true. You might think, hey, they they are making me sign a statement that isn't true. It's a lie. By doing this, the bank is putting that lie that you received a loan into your mouth. You are the one signing it and saying it, and that gives them a privilege to say the borrower says and agrees that they received a loan. So we'll, we'll proceed on the basis of what they said and signed. Wow. <laughs> wow. Put that in your pipe and smoke it, eh? Ain't that something? Wow. They signed the papers saying that they've received the loan. We, we go ahead and behave as though they did not receive it. And we require them to make payment. God. Mm. That wow. is not fair transaction when no loan was provided to you in transaction. No money was actually provided to you as a loan. In return for providing a loan to you, you have to pay the bank a payment every month for the next 30 days, 30 years. But the seller got to pay oh, Right. Where did the money come from? The next question that comes into play is, if no loan was provided, where did the money come from to pay the seller of the house? The guy I brought the house from got paid. Where did the money come from? This is where the whole loan process gets interesting. <laughs> You, you got to get a copy of this and read this, Andre. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll compare yeah. what happened in a normal real estate transaction with an analogy. Let's say that I advise, advertise my car for sale. I'm still driving a 1999 Honda Civic, even though it, was, it has 120,000 miles on it. You know, what, you know about Honda. They run long, they run for a long time. So I put on Craigslist for $2,400, hoping I could sell it at least $2,000. You see, it advertised, you come over, take a look at the Honda, you offer $2,000. So I say, that sounds great. You have a deal. You tell me you would like to pay by check. Is that a deal? I say, Sure, I understand. People don't want to walk around with $2,000 cash all the time. You can write me a check. However, I'm not going to let you take the car until the check clears. Mm -hmm. say, That's fine. We agree. We have a deal. You write me a check, I give you a receipt, and that protects your side of the deal. I take that check, I deposit it in my account, I draw funds off of it, the, re the rest of it I leave in the account. Within a couple of days, your check, you check your bank account uh, uh, online, you see that there is $2,000 less in your bank account. Furthermore, I can see that there is $2,000 more in my bank account. Your check has cleared. That means you're going to come and knock on my door. We, we both acknowledge that the check is cleared. You say to me that it's time for, me, for you to take the car and the title. But I say to you, all right, I'll give you the keys to the car, but I, I've decided to change the deal. Wow. 
I'm not going to transfer the title over to you. You can take possession, but I'm I'm not going to actually give you the title to the to the to the car until you pay me forty five dollars a month for the next twenty years. Would you do that? That's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> so you're paying for it twice. <laughs> yes. That would never happen to anyone. No one would ever agree to that. But that's what you do with a house. Yet every day of the week in thousands of market transactions all over the country, this type of scenario is taking place. The are writing these loans, making borrowers enter into these uh, uh, unfair arrangements for one exception to the car buying scenario, and that is disclosure. That's the word you got to remember, Andre. They did not yeah, give you full disclosure. Yeah. I disclosed to you when you came to take full possession of the car that we both understood that the payment in in full had, had been made. That's really the only difference between this car sales scenario and when people get into these mortgage loan arrangements. They never tell you that the car was paid for when you come back to get and it. That's why it takes that's why it takes you so long to close on the house. Yes. It's never really closing on it. Yes. But they have to trick you and they do it through uh time delay and your anxiousness to get into the new house. Yeah. And when the time when the time is right, it'll flip so fast nobody will ask questions. And there is not disclosing that there actually isn't any lending going on. They're not telling you that the note you sign is not a promissory note. It is actually a cashier's check or a bank note. When you look at how it is structured, when you sign your name to the note and hand that over to the lender, this is what happens to the note. The lender takes the note as though it were a cashier's check or a personal check and deposits that um, document into their bank account as if paid in full. The banks accept these promissory note documents as negotiable instruments and treat them as a cashier's check or cash deposit. That promissory note becomes a cash deposit to the bankers who deposited it into their account. It becomes cash to the bankers, and you pay off your house with cash as far as the bank is concerned by signing that promissory note at escrow. How the bank treats your note on the on their record. In this fractional banking system, fractional banking system, for every dollar that is deposited in any particular bank branch, that branch has the ability to issue $10 of credit. That's that uh, uh, hypothecate. Remember I told you that the other night. They hypothecate a deposit. You put in $1 and they can lend $10 because they can, they can get nine, nine zeros they can put on that $1. Absolutely. Wow. It's un- crazy. It's crazy. Woof, but it works. <laughs> Your cash yeah, deposit working. the promissory note you sign that escrow creates an asset they can use. Think of two hundred and fifty thousand yep. dollar note that is put into the deposit. That means two point five million to the bank. It's a great deal for the bank. It's not a great deal for you. The bank did not disclose to you that when you come to the escrow table, which is the closing table, to sign all the paperwork, that payment in full was already made by you. You were fooled into issuing to them what you thought was merely a promise promise to pay, but they took your promissory note as a payment in full. You paid in full. This is a 20-page article, and I ain't going to be able to deal with all of it. But I'm going to read it. I can tell you that. 
I am going to read it and figure out, because this thing is heavy, because we're only talking about just one violation that everybody is guilty of, of having. I'm not guilty, but you, you have access to this one violation. That is the promissory note. They did not give you full disclosure of the trigology that they used on you. That you never received any case. See, you got to have more than just that. But this is a good start. So they haven't, they haven't even went into securitization because they've already tricked you into paying in full and you didn't know it. They've already put nine zeros on the back of whatever your note was. Now, yep. within 90 days, they are prepared to sell your note to New York to get it on the open market so they can securitize it and sell it in the open market and then come back to the lower borrower and get monthly payments. Wow. That ain't a good word. This has got to be RICO. And everybody's involved because the the, 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 the the judge is supposed to be sure that the paperwork is in order and never have the banks or the the, um, the, the uh, 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 law firms ever prove that they own the house. So how can they take it? They, unbelievable. They, it is. It is. It is unbelievable, brother. And it's so unbelievable that it's kind of scary. It's kind of scary. All right, we're at the top of the hour. And uh, I, I can finish this baby out on Tuesday. I'll do a part on Tuesday, on Tuesday to uh, finish this up. Because this one here, this article here, I'm on the sixth page. And it's got twenty pages. You can imagine what you in store for when I when I get to the whole thing. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm telling you. I'm gonna be sending you. I'm gonna be sending you something in a few minutes. I just got through doing your radio drop. So okay. you know, station identification. So be on the lookout All for right. that email. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna I'm gonna stay online and. And uh, play this play this jam again. That's what's because up. we're getting to we got about twenty seconds left. And I hope everybody I didn't get a lot of callers today, but I got enough that they understand or they should understand where I'm at. And they can call me if they have any questions. Area code three one three six five six seventy two eight three. You can call me. And you can go to my website, ronmarch.com. And uh, we will have, well, we still have our uh, DVD in order on uh, uh, at the end of the weekend. Andre, you still on target? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing up with it right now. So we, I should have something for you uh, in the next day or two here. So Okay. Looking, it, uh, we're looking good. How many parts do you, are we going to have? Part one, part two, part ten? How many? Or do you um, know yet? I'll let you know. I don't, I don't know yet. I'll okay. let you know. Yeah. All right. All right. All right, good people. Until Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, Ron March will sign off. And I appreciate it, the audience, and I appreciate the time. I hope you got something out of it. I'm going to do a part two come Tuesday.